If you're of a certain age like me, then you might well remember a simple board game that was popular a few decades ago. Heck, people might still be playing it for all I know. I'm talking about a game with coloured pegs that was sold in Britain under the name Mastermind. I don't know what the American name was. It was played between two people, the concealer and the guesser. The game was played with a large number of coloured pegs that fitted in holes on a small plastic board. The original edition had six colours, red, yellow, green, blue, black and white, although a later deluxe version increased this to eight. The concealer thought of a combination of four pegs and placed these out on the board while the guesser's head was turned, covering them up with a small screen so that the guesser couldn't see them. Then the guesser turned back round to face the concealer. The aim of the game was for the guesser to work out exactly what the concealer's combination was. If he was able to do that within a certain number of goes, the guesser won that round. If not, the concealer won the round. Then the concealer and guesser swapped places and played again. The guesser worked out the combination by making educated guesses, which were then marked by the concealer depending on how close to the correct combination they were, with feedback given by means of smaller black and white markers. The best way to explain how is with an example game. Suppose the concealer chooses the combination red, black, yellow, black, as shown. Yes, colours can appear more than once in the chosen combination. Indeed, the combination could contain four pegs of the same colour, if the concealer wanted. The concealer covers the combination with a screen and invites the guesser to make a move. The guesser first tries white, green, white, green. This is a particularly bad choice, as not a single peg is the right colour. As such, it is awarded no black markers and no white markers. However, the guesser now knows that there are no white or green pegs in the combination, and resolves not to use either of those colours in future guesses. Next he tries red, yellow, blue, yellow. Now there is a red peg in the combination, and it happens to be first in line, exactly where the guesser placed it. This earns a black marker, indicating the right colour in the right position. The combination also contains a single yellow peg, of which the guesser has used two, but the yellow peg is in the third position in the combination, not second or fourth as in his guess. This earns a white marker, indicating a correct coloured peg, but in the wrong position. The fact that there are two yellow pegs in the guess, and only one in the combination is irrelevant, it still gets only one white marker. Similarly, if the combination had contained two yellow pegs, and the guess had only one yellow in it, in the wrong position, that would have been awarded only one white marker too. Now the guesser tries black, red, blue, blue. Ah, I can see his reasoning processes here. He's wondering if it was the blue peg that was the right colour in the right place, and possibly the red peg that was the right colour in the wrong place. Unfortunately, this is taking a step away from the correct target. However, this guess does not go unrewarded. There is indeed both a black in the combination and a red, but not in places specified, so the guess gets two white markers. And so the game continues, with further guesses getting closer and closer, with any luck, to the correct combination. The guesser wins if one of his guesses is awarded four black markers, indicating four right colours all in the right positions before he runs out of holes on the board, whereupon the concealer removes the screen to reveal the matching combination. Otherwise, the concealer wins. In practice, this game generally proves remarkably taxing on the old brain, because it is difficult to second-guess the concealer. It is so easy to get a bee in one's bonnet, convinced that the combination must contain two reds, for instance, and follow a particular false line of reasoning, only to find out at the end that it only contained one red. A computer acting as a guesser wouldn't suffer from these miniature obsessions and would treat all possibilities that match the black and white barkers as being equally likely. Clearly, this is a game almost tailor-made for the generation test procedure. The computer starts with every possible combination and whittles the list down according to very simple logical rules until there is only one possible solution left, and that's the subject of this demonstration program. Since it's the intelligence of the computer we are trying to prove, the human player always takes the part of the concealer and the computer the part of the guesser. If the computer can work out the human's combination in ten moves, it wins. Otherwise, the human wins. Firstly, 
What graphics will you need for the game? Only eight, in fact. The six colours for the pegs, represented by six coloured circles, and the black and white markers, represented by two smaller circles. I have chosen to make my graphics PNG files, and name them simply red, yellow, green, etc., with the markers being named small black and small white. Now the HTML part of the game. After a brief paragraph explaining how to use the program, there is a table with ten rows, representing the ten possible tries that the computer has. The table contains three columns, with the one on the left simply numbered one to ten, the middle one holding the successive guesses the computer makes, and the right one containing the marks awarded by the player. The cells contain span tags, which allow their content to be updated after the table has been displayed on the screen. The rows are numbered from 0 to 9 to make programming easier, with the two rightmost cells of the top row called row 0 and mark 0, the cells below that row 1 and mark 1, and so on. Above that is a button that, thanks to an on-click property, calls the function initialize, which causes the computer to make its first guess. The idea is that the human player thinks up his combination and writes it down on a piece of paper before clicking on the button. On entering the code, some global variables are set up. The array colours contains the names of the colours in order, so the colour red is represented by the digit 0 inside the program, and yellow by the digit 1, and so on. This array is used to translate digits into graphic names for display on the screen. The variable row represents which guess the program is making. It is 0 for the first guess, 1 for the next, and so on. When it reaches 10, as shown by the variable num rows, then the game is over and the human player has beaten the computer. T is an array of four numbers which holds the current try by the program. For instance, to present red, green, red, white for marking, T will hold the digits 0, 2, 0 and 5 for the individual colours. Similarly, the variable list is an array whose elements are the various remaining four-digit possibilities as they are gradually removed. It is an array of arrays. The number of possibilities remaining is held in list length. Although JavaScript does give you a way of determining the length of the array automatically, we will continually be taking possibilities away from the list, and the easiest way to keep track is through a simple variable, list length. The function initialize, caused by clicking on the button, essentially resets every row to blank by filling the row and mark span elements with blank strings. Note the global variable row is set to zero to indicate that this is the program's first guess of the game. Initialize then picks four random digits, in the range 0 to 5 inclusive, for the array t, to represent the first attempt, which it then presents on the screen using the function display pattern. Since the program has had no feedback yet, these digits might as well be random. One digit is as good as another at this stage. There are three functions used to display coloured pegs on the screen. Firstly, function BD turns a digit into appropriate HTML code for displaying a coloured peg. Function cell produces a select drop-down list so that the player can let the program know how many black or white markers any try gets. Cell is given a parameter NME which will be the word black for the small black markers and the word white for the small white markers. The code is essentially the same for both drop-down lists, except the name. The function display pattern makes use of both these functions in filling in the span elements for this row. It calls function bd four times, with the four digits of array t, and puts the resulting HTML in the row element. It calls the function cell twice, to create the drop-down lists for black markers and white markers, and puts the result in the mark span element, together with the button done, which the player presses once the marking has been completed. This button calls the function done row, where the program processes that feedback. I've split this function over two slides, as it's quite involved. The first thing it does is read the two values from the drop-down lists and stores them in the variables numblacks and numwhites. It then replaces the drop-down lists and the button with HTML code to display those black and white markers, or a blank if there aren't any, in terms of the small circles. The variables numblacks and numwhites are combined to form the two-digit number, 
with the number of black markers the tens digit and the number of white markers the units digit. If there were two black markers and one white, for example, this would be turned into the number 21. It might seem unnecessary, but it does mean that we only have to deal with one number instead of two. If that score is 40, it represents four black markers, a perfect score, and the computer has won the game. Assuming that isn't the case, the program calls either the function construct list, the first attempt, or whittle list for all other attempts. The functions construct list and whittle list do all the heavy lifting in this game, starting with construct list. Since this is the very first try that the program has made, the list of possible next tries doesn't exist yet. This function goes through every possible combination of colours, that's the purpose of those nested for loops, and uses each in turn to mark the current try. This is achieved using the function mark, which produces a score for that combination and attempt. What the program is asking is, if this particular arrangement of colours were the true combination, would my first attempt have produced that score that it did? If so, then that arrangement is a candidate for the correct one and is added to the array list. Finally, the function chooses one of the combinations at random from the ones it has kept and presents it as the next attempt using display pattern. The function whittle is so long that it also needs to be split over two slides. In addition, I've had to compress a few lines. Sorry about that. The first thing that happens is that variable row is increased by one. If this means that the program has filled every slot in the table, then the human player has won. Otherwise, there is still everything to play for, and the score is used to whittle down the list of possibles. The variable r steps through that list, and at each stage, the entry in the array is used to mark the current attempt. If the two are incompatible, then the entry in the array must be removed. This is the part with the variable r2, which shuffles up every candidate after this one, to cover the wrong one up. It also reduces the length of the list by one. Of course, if that means the list ends up with no entries in it, then something has gone wrong. There must be at least one entry in that list, as it must contain the true solution. The chances are that this is due to wrong marking from the human player, rather than a bug in the program, but the error message is too polite to suggest that. Assuming that there is at least one solution left to choose from, one is chosen at random and copied into array T, to be presented as the next attempt. And so it goes on, try after try, until the program gets four black markers, or runs out of chances. Or there's an unexplained error, of course. Almost done. There's only one other function that we need to look at, and that's the function mark, which compares the presented pattern with the candidate combination. This function returns a single number, which is the number of black and white markers that the digits in T would earn, if the candidate combination were the true one. Both the marker counts are compressed into a two-digit number, as before. The candidate combination is presented as four separate parameters, PAT1, PAT2, PAT3 and PAT4, combined into one array called TestPAT within the function. This is to avoid any pass-by reference errors that tend to happen when passing arrays as parameters. The same happens with the digits in T. I don't use T directly, but copy those digits into an array called TestCom which I can massacre without it affecting T in the outside world. Firstly, we check for black markers and add 10 to the value of the score for every one we find. A loop goes through the four digits, and if it finds one in testcom that matches the corresponding one in test pat, SC is increased by 10. After that, we need to disable these digits so that they won't cause a spurious match when we check for white markers. We replace the digit in test com by minus 1 and the digit in test pat by minus 2 so that they no longer match any other colour or each other. Checking for a white marker requires a nested loop. This is because we are checking every digit in test com in turn, that's the outer loop, with every digit in test pat, that's the inner loop. Of course, it does mean that corresponding digits will be checked again, but if they earned a black marker the first time, then the two digits have been disabled. For every white marker found, SC is increased by 1. Finally, the function returns the value of SC. Phew, there you are. 132 lines of JavaScript code, and this is just one side of the game. The obvious improvement 
will be to implement the other side, where the computer thinks of a four-colour combination and the human has to get it. At least that way, it will be a proper game. You'll also find that the computer, being logically rigorous, invariably manages to work out your combination within four or five moves, six at the outside. This means that to give the human being a fighting chance, you might like to decrease the value of num rows to, say, four. Either that, or add more digits and more colours, like the deluxe version of the board game. The other obvious question is, can you think of any other situations where an approach like this one would work well? Not necessarily a board game between two players, but any situation at all. If you do, please do let me know in the comments, and, of course, don't forget to click the like button for this video and subscribe to the channel. The link for the code on my website is below, in the description, and you might like to view my video on Generate and Test that inspired this one, if you haven't already done so. Thank you.